Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very, very accomplished and respected tech professional from Sydney, Australia, Mr. Greg Griffiths. Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Ashosh. Very nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, Greg is a business consultant uh, with the Royal Family Office in the UAE. He's the founder and chairman of IDX, IDEAX Ventures and you Crowd Me. So, uh, Greg, let me start by asking you about tell you know your own journey uh, as a business consultant with the Royal Family. Yeah, so look, it's, it's been interesting, uh, my particular journey, and um, I won't obviously bore you and your viewers to death, but um, I, I originated from Bournemouth, the south coast of England, mm-hmm. um, and had previously worked for my father in, you know, several different sales and operational roles. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I wanted more from life and wanted to test myself, um, you know, a lot more and and at the same time leave a smallish, you know, town. Mm-hmm. So I uh, I packed up my suitcases. I went to New York City in 1999. Mm. Uh, I went there with no visa, um, but I I did always want to um, you know work in finance. I had a passion for finance, and mm-hmm. of course it's the Big Apple. So who doesn't want to you You're know right. be a part of the Big Apple experience? Um, and so I was right at the epicenter of that. I spent mm. several years working there. Uh, I met my wife in New York. Um, and then we we moved back to the UK um, mm-hmm. before you know deciding on our next you know journey, mm-hmm. uh, and that next journey was uh, was Sydney, Australia. So oh, this this is why I'm here. I, I've been here since 2004. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my second passion, um, which was probably my first, but it's always been technology. I've always mm-hmm. been you know one of those kids, not necessarily a geek. But I've always been amazed with, you know, what technology can do, what it mm. brings, how it can empower people. Um, and so I spent the last uh, 18 years here uh, working predominantly with um, fortune companies, large enterprise companies um, in a sales and innovation and marketing perspective, mm-hmm. um, you know, focusing more on strategic advisory uh, engagements and consultations mm-hmm. uh, for the likes of LG Electronics, Prudential, Commonwealth Bank, Westpac Bank, ANZ mm-hmm. Bank, DBS Bank in Singapore, okay. and so forth. And and so through my history and through my experience in being in a more of a sales or executive sales role, consulting to 2IC, mm-hmm. um, that enabled me to engage uh, with you know multiple partners that we have, but one in particular, as you mentioned, is the private um, office of the Al Qasimi family in Dubai, UAE. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I spent quite a bit of time working with them and understanding what some of their ambitious goals were. Mm-hmm. Like everything in the UAE, everything's ambitious. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you look at what they've done in the last fifty years, they kind of probably the best example globally of any country Mm -hmm. that is innovative and Mm -hmm. does what they say they're going to do. Um, And so my, my role with them um, now is to really sort of provide business advice around new investment opportunities, whether that be, you know, startups or corporations or uh, private investment from other offices uh, and really sort of managing that process from a business development perspective. Mm-hmm. And also being acutely aware of, you know, cultural support that is required from, you know, governments and, and offices and so forth. So, yeah, um, yeah it's been a really enjoyable and still is a very enjoyable, uh, you know, part of what I do on a weekly basis. Mm-hmm. Um, more recently, I have been advising them on crypto and Web3 technology-related conversations, mm. uh, which is probably more um, suited to what we've been doing Correct. the last few years. So, that, you know, this is a great segue to uh, moving on into talking about Idea X Ventures. Uh, tell me a little bit about Idea X Ventures, and then we'll talk about Web3 and crypto and blockchain. Beautiful, beautiful. So IDX Ventures uh, is a relatively newish company. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was born out of an opportunity within the market where there are not really Web3 companies focused on startups Mm. or startup investors in that space. Mm. Um, And so 
having gone through the process of raising funds myself for my own startup and realizing pre-COVID and during COVID how difficult it is, Mm -hmm. uh, we figured there must be a better way to do things. Mm -hmm. And so focusing predominantly on Web3, although there are some Web2 projects that we work with, Mm -hmm. um, we want to create a platform which is now live, um, our beta platform, and that's really about providing you know some basic level one due diligence and verification mm-hmm. on the startup and the investor mm-hmm. providing a more personalized one-on-one engagement in terms of investors can chat with startups on the platform mm-hmm. uh, they can email they can send proposals they have that you know much more in sync connection together mm-hmm. um, we're building out a whole um, early stage startup ecosystem as well to support the platform. So it's not just about deals. It's about something bigger than that, which mm-hmm. is the community, which is the ecosystem. Um, and we will be introducing Web3 online learning courses through our existing partners and customers, mm-hmm. which again is to there to support the wider ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And so ultimately, um, IDRX Labs you know, will be the number one platform where Web3 startup and investors go to. Fabulous. And for uh, my viewers and listeners, I know a lot of the young people understand Web3, but I also have many uh, older listeners. Right. Uh, How is the Web3 different from the Web2? Apart from one number, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. Um, For me personally, Web3 is the next evolution of the internet. Correct. That's probably the easiest way to describe it. Mm. Um, You know, it builds off Web2, which obviously... Um, is where we were. Um, And obviously, Web2 is really the internet. Mm. So Web3 is a decentralized version of the internet that is supported by some very amazing tools and technologies, such as blockchain, such as artificial intelligence, Mm. such as machine learning. Um, It's really about giving the internet power back to the people in a more private, secure, decentralized manner. Mm. And uh, what are some of the opportunities and challenges as we transition from the Web 2 to Web 3? Uh, great question. Um, in terms of the opportunities, look, I think we're seeing a lot of opportunities right now. And mm-hmm. I sort of touched on that in my last uh, response. It's really about giving you know a lot of the power back to the people in terms of their own private data. You know, they don't want governments and corporations and it's not because everyone's a criminal Mm -hmm. they feel it's their data it belongs to them and quite rightly so and so they want to stop you know the whole juggernaut the global juggernaut of you know um regulations and government you know stopping that um in terms of other opportunities you know it does provide a clear concise um transparent view Mm -hmm. of data that's being recorded on the blockchain Mm -hmm. uh that is immutable Um, It means that it can't be, you know, hampered or changed while it's going from point A to point B. Mm. So what what that means is uh, whether it's a consumer sending money from, um, you know, India to Sydney or it's a company that's um, sending, you know, a large batch order from one bank to another bank, Mm. it means what's being sent is what's being delivered. Correct. I think that's really important because so much time effort and resources has been wasted on Web2 technologies Mm. where you're having to double check and triple check that this amount is actually the amount coming through. Mm. Um, So I think there's a lot of opportunities, especially in, um, you know, uh, law firms, accounting firms, logistic firms, uh, anywhere where there's, you know, private, confidential or valuable data Mm -hmm. that can be commercialized onto a blockchain Mm. uh, and create opportunities. Uh, in terms of the challenges, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's a tough one because a lot of these, uh, and I'll just talk about companies and corporates for now, Yeah, a lot of them have legacy infrastructure. Mm. And legacy, it typically means old. Infrastructure, in this case, typically means you know servers and databases and that type of thing. And so where they have these huge investments, and in the bank's cases, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm. You can't just rip that out and then put in a Web3 solution. Correct. And so some of the challenges is how do we transition from Web2 to Web3? Mm. How do we retrain employees? 
how do we integrate with legacy systems? Mm. You know, th these are very strategic initiatives, which, you know, are challenges. You know, these are things which uh, will cost money. But at the same time, mm -hmm. if companies don't do this, they will become the next Kodak or the next Sony. You know, they mm. will not be around in 10 years. Correct. Correct. But uh, my next question to you, Greg, is that will the Web3 and blockchain introduce complete transparency that is ultimately most desirable? Look, I, I think so. I think, you know, it's probably one of the most important founding pillars uh, of Web3. Um, mm. I think, obviously, there's decentralized and centralized. Decentralized is obviously public for the people. Um, centralized is predominantly for companies and their customers internally focused. Um, the technology doesn't change. The use case changes. Mm -hmm. But I think blockchain today now is probably the best example of technology that can provide a transparent solution mm. um, and provide that governance, um, you know, as opposed to other methods out there. Mm, interesting. And now let me move to a third aspect, uh, which is the metaverse, which seems to be fascinating the whole world right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what is the difference between the metaverse and the Web3? So the metaverse to me, well, I mean, if you go back um, to, well, even looking at uh, Call of Action or Call of Duty, mm. um, you know, immersing yourself in an augmented reality world. Um, you know, some people go there to play games. Some people go there to meet friends. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, you can look at some of the world's top brands like Adidas and Puma mm. uh, and Red Bull that are, you know, loving this new metaverse because it gives them an opportunity to, not just promote and market their products, mm. but also now is the ability for them to sell their products in the metaverse. Mm. And so it's a really great example of how uh, companies, they don't have to be big brands. Mm. You could buy a product from someone in Turkey mm. where they would never normally have that opportunity. They can design their store off the back of their own physical store. Mm. And this is where obviously digital twin smart cities come into play. Mm. Um, and so the, the metaverse um, being its 3D augmented reality, mm. um, Web3 predominantly being, you know, the next version of the internet for the people. Mm. Very interesting. But yet, you know, given the fact that it's all augmented reality, it is 3D, but in Web3 or in, 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 in cyberspace, so to speak, um, you still need the brick and mortar uh, a business at the back to be able to fulfill a customer's actual needs or aspirations. You do exactly, exactly, and I think you know that's always going to be there to a degree. Mm. Um, it really just comes down to the individual businesses. Mm. Um, you know, you've noticed there's a lot of uh, businesses going online now and having um, fulfillment centers or logistic centers or dispatch centers. Mm. Uh, and Amazon is a great example of this. You know, they're kind of like the kings of setting up the world's largest, you know, logistics factories, mm. automating them. Um, there's obviously still people working there, but the way things are going, um, there's better efficiencies using robots. Mm. Um, and those staff are being redeployed elsewhere. But I think, you know, depending on the type of business, mm. um, you know, there will still be the need of bricks and mortar or that sort of front face. Mm. Very interesting. Now, my next question comes to blockchains, uh, Greg, you know, and I've often been asked this question that while blockchain is going to be very, very good for business, etc., how will it impact the lives of the common individual? So I think currently, you know, you know, Bitcoin blockchain was created by the same person, right? So Satoshi Nakamoto. Yeah. And, you know, it was created for the people. And this is the sort of underlying theme here, people power for the people. Mm. And that's because people were fed up in having governments, you know, track what they're doing with their money and so forth. So it's about freedom. Mm. And so some of the things now which are currently available do provide for significantly faster and cheaper and mm. more secure payments being made from point A to point B for you know the common person. Mm. And when this becomes really important is, especially in third world countries, where there isn't necessarily the same infrastructure or ability for people to go to, to banks and so forth, but they still have mm. you know 3G, 4G, 5G. 
Mm. It enables them to, um, you know, be involved in commercial transactions or, or commercial uh, opportunities for their businesses. Mm. And so, you know, there's a, there's a big, you know, movement right now of the last three years of telecommunication providers working with blockchain companies mm. who actually start putting uh, credits onto their phone that can then be used in store or through other third parties, mm. but secured and verified on the blockchain. Well, and so there's some really fantastic, you know, business use cases where, especially in the third world countries. Hmm. And then, you know, if you look at day to day, you know, contracts can go on the blockchain for mortgages, for your lawyer, hmm. other business agreements, other financial transactions through credit cards. And so it's just really about creating, you know, a, a single transparent, visible uh, destination on the ledger for them. Mm, very interesting. But yet one of the other concerns that is often expressed about the blockchain is that while it's a completely open platform and transparent, what happens to data security and privacy? So great question. Um, in terms of data security, if we, if we talk about public first, um, the way it's been architected on the smart ledger contract or on the blockchain, mm. um, you know, it provides that as part of that solution. Mm. Um, the reality is each individual that's interacting in a transaction, both have to have their public and private key. Mm. And based on the number of characters in those keys, it's physically impossible that anyone can figure out what the other person's keys are. Mm. Uh, so that's probably the first thing that's the most important. Mm. Um, but then when you start looking at, uh, I guess, potential challenges around security, a lot of people have cold wallets. Most have hot wallets. Mm -hmm. So a hot wallet would be like a MetaMask mm -hmm. or a wallet provided by an exchange or, or a third party. Mm. You know, those do pose um, potential threats around data security and privacy. Mm. And in terms of um, you know, are, are they uh, elusive to being hacked? Well, no, because hackers use the same um, types of methods in this scenario. Mm. Um, and so if you want pure data security with blockchain mm. and crypto, 100% mm. focus on cold wallets that are not connected to something. Mm. But, you know, I'd love to get from you the perspective uh, on some people are even complaining about why should their name be on a part of social media because of their uh, personal security or privacy. And on the other yeah. hand, here is a completely open platform that is uh, permitting people to come and see everything about us. How how relevant is some uh, is the criticism uh, like, you know, like this for protecting an individual's privacy and data security? Yeah, look, I think it's very relevant. I mean, you know, there's obviously a lot of news right now with Elon Musk and Twitter and free speech and, you know, mm. all that sort of stuff. But then mm. there's Facebook and, uh, you know, monetizing people's data, which I think, you know, is, you know, a really bad thing personally. Um, I think the main thing is really transparency with what happens to that data, where does that data reside and who that data is ultimately going to. Correct. You know, because... You could be a customer of um, uh, DBS Bank in Singapore, and mm. DBS Bank might have 1,000 partners. Well, they do share your information with those partners, mm. but how do you know that all of those partners are good, are good people or good players in the game? And that's where obviously a lot of uh, situations happen where data is leaked and data is hacked. Mm. Um, you know, I think there should be the option at the end of the day. Um, there are you know, new platforms that are trying to get mainstream that uh, allow you to verify once and, and that's it. You can identify as X or Y. Mm -hmm. There's no personal information on these platforms. And I think that's something which we should be going more down that path or at least mm -hmm. providing an option to consumers whether or not they want to share that information mm -hmm. and whether or not they want to, um, you know, have adverts that are now being displayed because they just looked at a fishing rod or, you know, a tennis racket. <laughs> uh, I think there needs to be a lot more conversation around how that data is managed mm -hmm. and what I see within my own privacy. Mm. Well, very interesting. And I've got time for one more question and I'll come back to the blockchain. What are some of the 
challenges and vulnerabilities of the blockchain? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's obviously been three or four, you know, large uh, vulnerable attacks, you know, in the last five years. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, you know, a lot of these can be managed um, and obviously they can in hindsight, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, the typical attacks you, you see with blockchain is phishing, which is via email, and that happens in any financial institution. Mm-hmm. Phishing, you know, via emails, pretending to be someone else. Yeah. Um, you know, the others through routing. Um, the others called a Sybil, S Y B I L, and the other one, the fourth one, is called a fifty-one percent attack. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll just sort of walk you through the first three. Yeah. Because they, they are very relevant to most scams when mm-hmm. it comes to financial institutions, banks, and so forth. Hmm. Um, and so phishing is the same process as receiving an e- email, pretending to be someone else. The email may look similar. It might say Greg at Bitcoin.com, hmm. but maybe the um, the eyes are one, you know, and it's slightly different. And they obviously want you to click on something. Hmm. And so there's definitely a vulnerability there. Uh, and that process, I think, you know, 100% has to be changed because it's applicable in many other uh, industry sectors. Mm. So I think phishing would be something we we should try and put a, a better, you know, global process around. Mm. Um, the next one, routers, is where they intercept data that's being transferred to the internet from your service provider. Mm-hmm. Um, and what they're trying to do is prevent the system to have a consensus, meaning they're not sure whether or not you're actually receiving the right information that you think you are. Mm-hmm. And so they can sort of act as, you know, a ghost in the background there. Um, and then the last one in a civil attack is where they're using false network identities, mm. where they flood the network and crash the system, and they leave you hanging while they're in the system doing what they're doing. Um, but again, th- those three are very typical with any financial institution. Um, so it's not like hackers are specifically targeting blockchain mm-hmm. in those three examples. Right. They could be tackling you know, any particular industry. Mm. Um, and we've had recently um, Optus got hacked um, and Medibank, which is one of the largest insurance companies here, mm. 9 million customers got hacked mm. using two of those three I've just mentioned. Wow. And they're not a blockchain company. Mm. So I think there has to be a better approach and conversation with governments mm. around how does hacking stop full stop, mm. regardless of industry. Mm. Very interesting. And on that note, Greg, uh, thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you for talking to me about your own journey, about Idea X Ventures, about Web3, about blockchain, about metaverse, um, and about some of the interesting challenges or vulnerabilities of the blockchain. Thank you again and good luck. Thank you so much, Ashley. It's been a real pleasure being on your show and hopefully there's been some value for your listeners and Absolutely. followers and members to uh, to take heed. Thank you again. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.